Welcome back, it's Becky. Today's video is the final installment in my storage cabinet series, where we'll be installing the cat tower and applying final finish and handles to the cabinet doors. We left off last time having completed the structural shelves and installed most of the doors. Back in part one, I cut a hole in one of the shelves for cat access. At first, we had some move-in boxes stacked there for him to climb, and he really seemed to like it and hung out there all the time. So we conceived of a more permanent ramp system to get him up and down. It consists of three ramps, which we cut from scraps of plywood into trapezoids, where the angled end cuts will meet up with the walls of the cabinet interior. Then we covered the ramps with pieces of old carpet to make it easier to grip and screw them in place. I traced and cut an opening in the cabinet door for Chaz to walk through using a jigsaw. Smokey also outfitted Chaz and Cat Tower with an overhead light fixture and some Christmas lights to illuminate the ramps. Our final set of hinges took a while to come in on back order. Then it was all about finding the right weekend to paint all the cabinet doors. We used one coat of primer and two coats of low VOC interior paint on the top and bottom doors, and we finished the middle row of doors with polycrylic. We originally did this because we liked the way it looked, but after using it for a while, I can tell you that the, the center row of cabinet doors are used more regularly, and our flat white paint has a habit of picking up dirt and showing it off more than the clear finish, so it's a win-win. The final step was to attach the door handles. We picked out these brushed nickel rectangular ones. I measured and placed them in position, then traced around and found the centers by drawing an X. I drilled a small pilot hole before switching to a larger bit that matched the size of the screws that came with the handles. Thanks for following along with this project series. It was so much fun to build and it's so functional for us in our new home. I put links to the previous installments in the description below, as well as the link to the Instructable for this project. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to catch my future projects about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. See you next time.
it's Becky. In today's video, I'm gonna explain the process I use to transform an electronics project idea into a working Arduino sketch. Developing the code for your project can be the most intimidating part, especially if you haven't done it a thousand times already. But you have to address it from the very start of the project, so let's just get started. First, and this may seem obvious, but write out the main purpose of the project idea. If it has multiple functions, decide which features are needed versus those that would be nice but aren't necessary at first. See also my previous video about common Arduino mistakes, including biting off more than you can chew. Keep it simple at first, you can always add to it later. Next, classify the project's inputs and outputs. A weather monitor might have a temperature and humidity sensor and a display of some kind. Internet projects might have a cloud service as an input, output, or both, like my Internet Valentine project, which also has a button input and LED and vibrating motor outputs for each circuit. The project I'm building today is a prop passkey evaluator that uses a membrane keypad input and outputs to an alphanumeric display as well as three indicator LEDs. The next step is to write pseudocode that attempts to walk through the program's main loop. Pseudocode is just plain words used to explain the program. It shouldn't be overcomplicated, but should sketch out the basic causes and effects you want to deal with in your program. Next up, select and evaluate hardware components that could work for your inputs and outputs. It's a little more complicated than just making sure you have enough pins available, but I'll save my hardware selection advice for another video. <laughs> Build and run a sample for each component you're working with. This involves downloading any relevant code libraries and checking out example code uh, that tests you've wired it up correctly. For inputs, you'll use the serial monitor to get some feedback. And then I added an alphanumeric display with an I squared C backpack and three different colored LEDs with their own, with each with their own resistor. I uploaded the sample code for the display to verify it's connected properly, then ran a simple blink sketch to test the LEDs. In both cases, I found wiring errors that I needed to fix. It's easier to discover that something's wired incorrectly at this stage when you're working with code that's known to work with the component at hand rather than trying to debug wiring and code at the same time. Start writing comments in your code that explain what each section does. You can create a new sketch where you'll paste in elements of all of your sample sketches to make your program. In the loop, if you don't have a good example to follow or want to write it from scratch, paste in your pseudocode as comments to start. Then you'll start to create the logical overall structure of the program. It's possible one of your sample sketches already does most of your core structure, or it might be easy to find something online that does. It's likely that somebody's already done something similar to your idea before, even if it uses different hardware. So I looked online and I found a few membrane keypad door lock projects, all using this password library. So I downloaded the library and I checked out the examples that came with it. And I got very lucky. There's a membrane keypad passkey evaluator sample that does exactly what I want. All I have to do is include my desired output. So code for the display and the LEDs. So now that I've found or made the basic structure of my project code, I want to pa start pasting in all the other elements from the other samples I tried. So I'm gonna, in my case, it's a sample, so I'm gonna go ahead and save it with a different name. And then I don't really need anything from the membrane keypad program, so I'll just close that one for now. And for the LED, so what I'm looking for is to consolidate everything before the setup, so all the variable declarations. In my case, I think I want to make some constants for the LED pins. We'll call it like red LED pin. And that's 10. And yellow is 11, and green is 12. And then we'll want to copy everything over from the setup too. So in this case, I'm just going to change the way those are represented a little so that they use the variables. See, in a, such a small program like this, it doesn't really matter if you use the, the number 10 throughout the program. But once you start getting into a bigger program, it really makes sense to abstract those into variable names. So in case you want to change the pin number later, 
you only have to change it one place. Great, okay, so I've declared them as outputs. One really good practice while you're doing this is to compile your program really often. That way, if there's an error, you'll be able to isolate it to just the time when you copied over such and such. Here's where it's pretty critical that you pay attention to matching curly braces, missing semicolons, and other typos that would make your program hard to debug. So now that it compiles with the pin initializations, I'm gonna go ahead and add the LED function I'm looking for. So my pseudocode said that the LED starts out yellow, so I might as well just turn that on during this setup. And then let's see, it says here add code to run if it works. So if there's success, I think let's turn the LED off while it's evaluating the password. So, and actually we also wanna reverse these so that the star and the pound, the star start resets and the pound checks the password. So while we're, after we reset the password, we can represent this like this instead. After we reset the password, let's turn the yellow LED off. So that while you're entering the password, the yellow LEDs, there's no LEDs on. Once you press the pound button, it's going to check the password. So then it goes down to this function. And if there's success, let's, let's turn on the green LED and then we'll wait a second and then turn it back off. And then you know what, let's do, let's do the red instead. Oops, oops, this is supposed to be green. And this is supposed to be red. Okay, so now we can compile that and test it out. Yellow's on, when I press star, it turns off. Great, that works awesome. So that's my basic function. Uh, adding the quad alphanumeric display is gonna be a little more tricky. So the first thing we'll do is grab all of the libraries and stick them with the other library includes at the top of the program. I'm going to create an object for the alphanumeric display. And then serial, we're going to the setup now. The serial begin, they're both at 9600 baud. Looks like during the setup in this sample code, it runs through a bunch of tests. But this one initializes it. So I add that one. Clear and then write display. Why not? We could try to take them out later. And then it says display every character. We don't really need to do that. And then we're not sure that we need this display buffer either. I don't think any uh, single word sample code came with this code library, but I can think of a project I've seen yeah, LED knuckle jewelry, so where it prints like a whole word that's four characters long. So here's the part where it just displays, and then, oh, and then here's a simple scroller too. Interesting, okay. Well, I've made it so it's only four letters, so we'll grab that, put it into the success, is open, and then, Again, for unsuccessful is nope. And then let's see, we'll want to clear the display after eat, after the minute, after the second's over. So there, that.
But just because your program compiles doesn't mean it does exactly what you want yet. For instance, I had mixed up my red and green LEDs when I first made this project. There will be undoubtedly be unexpected issues that will come up once you put all the elements together and you actually see how it's working, you might change what you want your program to do. This is the nature of coding. You'll want to keep track of your different iterations, so be smart about how you name your files. I recommend using version numbers. When you get to a milestone, name it version 2, then save a version 3 and start making new changes. After your base project is working, then it's cool to go ahead and add any other features from your nice to have list or others that you brainstormed during the build. Thanks for following along. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to catch my future projects about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. See you next time. Welcome back, it's Becky. Today I'm making a geometric succulent planter that's designed in Tinkercad and print on my new CR10S Pro. The planter has five chambers and a catch tray. You can get the model on Thingiverse and also from the Instructable for this project, both linked in the video description. To model the planter, I hollowed out a truncated octahedron, which is available deep in the shape generator section of the Tinkercad parts bin. Models are made up of solids and holes, so the hole centered within the solid when merged will result in a thin-walled hollow form. After duplicating and arranging the shapes, I then opened up the tops by merging with some rectangle-shaped holes. The drainage is accomplished the same way. You can remix this model by making a copy of it on Tinkercad. I sliced the model for printing using Cura to prep for printing on the Creality CR10S Pro. I printed the model using Hatchbox PLA in pure white and wood varieties. I've never had a printer with a heated bed before, and I'm impressed with how fast and easy it was to get set up and calibrated. This is not a sponsored video, but I want to disclose and thank Creality for sending me this printer. I love it. As a final step to protect my planters from moisture and UV light, I spray them with concrete sealer. It won't make them last forever, but it will prolong their life. I'm not sure if this stuff is inert enough to use with plants you want to eat though, like herbs. Is it best to grow edible plants in a more natural material like clay terracotta to be safe? For succulents, use a potting soil formulated for them with good drainage. It's important that they can dry out completely between waterings and the plastic material doesn't allow water to evaporate through it like a clay pot would, making the soil mix that much more important. Yeah. I keep mine in a south-facing window in the warmer months and under a grow lamp in the winter. If you make one, I'd love to see it in the comments on Instructables or Thingiverse.
Welcome back, it's Becky. Today I'll show you how to make this silver ring that holds a glass RFID tag. It's the same kind folks get implanted in their hands to unlock things like doors, computers, vehicles. Now I'm not quite brave enough to get the implant, but I do like making jewelry and wearing rings. So this solution is perfect for me. Let's get started. I got these tiny glass and pool tags and RFID reader from Trossen Robotics. They are the daintiest tags I could find. Normally, when mounting a stone on a ring, it's surrounded on at least one side by metal. But I was worried the standard bezel would impact the tag readability, so I wanted to create a design that would allow the most possible open space around the tag. I prototyped the design without a tag just to see how comfortable it was before scaling up to add the extra pieces and figure out the construction.
To test out the ring, I'm using an RFID Arduino shield with a sample sketch that prints to the serial monitor. Next, I think I'll try to get it working as a password helper using an Arduino that acts as a keyboard, because I've done that in the past. I've made a couple RFID rings in the past. First in an old make video using resin to encapsulate the rings, and once during my NFC manicure video for Adafruit where I used it to unlock my phone. Neither one is as nice as this new version though, and to celebrate, I'm giving away two custom-sized RFID rings in this new style. One over on Instagram and one on my Patreon. Links to those are in the description where you'll also find the other RFID projects I mentioned. Thanks for following along. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to catch my future projects about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. See you next time. Today, we're making a plush toy that's simple to sew by hand. This tutorial is based on my friend Moxie's Free Range Monsters project in Craft Magazine, Volume 6. I've used this project for years to teach introductory sewing to my students at SBA. It's fun, creative, and doesn't require much in the way of specialized tools. The first step is to make a paper pattern. 
create a character, or just randomly arrange some shapes. Just be sure none of its features are too skinny, or you'll have trouble turning it right side out later on. If your fabric is fuzzy like mine, pay attention to the direction of the fuzz, which is called the nap. My fabric also has a clear right side and wrong side. Cut two pieces of fabric in the shape of your pattern so that one is the mirror image of the other. Stack them together with the right sides facing each other and clamp the aligned edges together with small clips or pins. Here's a tip for setting up your thread. Double it over after threading your needle to bring the two ends together. To make an extra big knot, wrap the thread around your forefinger. Then pinch in your thumb and use it to spin the strands down to the tip of your finger, where then you can cinch down the newly formed twisted loops into a tight and messy knot. Stitch the fabric together along the outside edges using a back stitch, which goes two steps forward, one step back. In other words, come up through the fabric two stitch lengths away, then step back by one stitch length to come down through the fabric at the same place the last stitch ends. When you're about to run out of thread, use the needle to stitch a knot by looping it through some previous stitches, then catching the loop before you pull it tight. Repeat and cut the needle free, then start stitching again right where you left off. Leave a gap in your stitches about four inches wide so that you can turn the toy right side out. At this point, I took the optional step of attaching some plushy toy eyes and a nose that I found online that pierced through the fabric. You could also wait until after stuffing to attach facial features to the outside of the toy using felt and fabric glue. Stuff the toy with small amounts of polyfill at a time, using a chopstick to get it down into the details of the toy's features. You can also stuff your toy with fabric scraps or even crumpled up plastic bags. I trimmed the long fur around its face. Then it's time to stitch the toy closed. My fabric's fur kept getting in the way, so I used a bit of plastic to keep it out of the way. I like to do this with a ladder stitch, which is when you make stitches along alternating sides of the opening, which stay on the right side of the fabric. When you tighten the stitches, the raw edges then turn inside the toy. To tie off the thread, create a knot and then bury the tail inside the toy. I used yarn and matching thread to create some hair to complete the look. Thanks for following along. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to catch my future projects about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. See you next time. Hey, it's Becky. Here's my crafty take on a skeleton costume for Halloween. It's a skeleton sweatsuit. Print out my free pattern and whip up this comfy costume complete with plush bones. This project will give you plenty of practice using your sewing machine's free arm, or you can skip the plush and just use fabric glue for a quick last minute look. Let's get started. I created a free printable pattern for this project, which you can find at the link in the description. Iron your white cotton jersey fabric. Fold it in half so the selvage edges are together, and pin the ribcage and arm pieces to the double layer fabric. The arm bones are easy to cut around without additional marks, but the ribcage is complex enough that I used a pencil to trace the pattern before cutting.
you will end up with two rib cage pieces and two of each arm bone piece. Lay your sweatshirt flat and align your first ribcage piece to the center top of the shirt, up towards the collar. If you are using fabric glue, now's the time to glue the ribcage in place by lifting one rib at a time. If you're taking the sewing route, pin the ribs in place and set your machine to a short zigzag stitch. Using the sewing machine's free arm, stitch around the ribs on one half only to allow space for stuffing. Use a chopstick to stuff fiber fill into the ribs on the sewn side. You may have to remove some of the pins temporarily. And then sew and stuff the ribs on the other side one at a time. I found it was easiest to sew around one rib and also around half of the next one, then stuff, then repeat. This way, the presser foot isn't trying to stitch too close to an already stuffed rib. Repeat the process for the second rib cage on the back of the sweatshirt. You might want to try on the shirt to get the placement of the arm bones right. Lay them out flat on the sleeve and pin, then stitch around them, leaving an opening for stuffing, and stuff the arm bones just like you did the rib cage. The sewing machine's free arm becomes even more important here, and it can become tricky to keep the fabric flat while stitching in the narrow parts of the sleeve. Try on for placement, then pin, stitch, and stuff the leg bone pattern pieces to your sweatpants. Start with the fronts or backs, stitch and stuff, then do the other side. I don't recommend pinning all the pieces in place at once, since it's tricky to manipulate the pants through the sewing machine while there are sharp pins sticking out of them everywhere. I made two of these skeleton sweatsuits for a coordinated couple's look. To accessorize our homemade costumes, we added a few store-bought items. Links to all the materials are in the description, where you'll also find a link to the complete step-by-step -step tutorial and printable pattern for this project. Thanks for following along! If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to catch my future projects about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. See you next time! Hey, it's Becky. This project makes use of a 12 volt battery, like you would use for a vehicle, for charging USB devices in case of a power outage or camping trip. After Hurricane Sandy in 2012, I was without power and used an inverter battery setup at home, but it was huge and heavy. This project revisits the concept with a smaller battery meant for motorcycles or ATVs and DC only charging. I also created an optional 3D printed battery topper to cover the battery contacts and hold the USB ports. Keep watching to find out how. You can find the complete tutorial for this project and the parts I used in the links in the description. First, I connected the USB charger to the battery to be sure it works and take some measurements. The red wire connects to the positive terminal, and the black wire connects to the negative terminal. My charger also has a fuse. The USB charger can be used just like this, and you can choose to be done with this project. Use a ruler or calipers to measure your battery and USB charger, and adjust the Tinkercad model to fit its dimensions with some tolerance. Definitely double check the measurements of your components before printing. I used an old battery that I can't find online, so yours is bound to be a little different.
After downloading the STL from Tinkercad, I used Cura software to prepare the model for printing. I flipped it upside down so it'll print with its flat surface down. Disconnect the USB charger from the battery and install it in the hole on the 3D printed topper using its included nut. Wire up the circuit, red to plus and black to minus, and set the topper on the battery. Tidy up the wires by tucking them into the empty space remaining in the front of the topper. The 8 amp hour battery at 12 volts gives me 96 watt hours. Divided by my phone's 11.2 watt hours and factoring in a 90% efficiency for, of the USB charger, I can get about 7.5 full phone charges from this battery. Or half that if I want to still use it to start a vehicle. Thanks for following along! If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe with the bell to be notified of my future projects about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. See you next time. Hey, it's Becky. Today I'll go over the process I use to create an automated cat food bowl for my elderly cat Chaz using a Wi-Fi board, micro servo motor, and some 3D printed parts. Let's get started. See, Chaz needs to eat breakfast before he can get his insulin, but I often forget to pick up his food dish before I go to bed, which means he eats overnight, spoils his appetite for breakfast, which throws off his insulin schedule. This dish uses a servo motor to close a lid over the food between the hours of midnight and 7.30 a.m. You can find a link to the parts I used as well as the step-by-step -step tutorial at the links in the description below. This cat feeder may not be secure enough for younger, more active cats. Chaz is, is old and frail, and he isn't inclined to try to pry the bowl open. There are products on the market that serve this function and work better in terms of keeping the cat out. Videos of these are hilarious and well worth the binge. The cat food bowl holder is based on Artie Lai's design on Thingiverse. I made it bigger to accommodate my cat's bowl and also made it shorter since scaling it up had made it too tall. I added a holder for a micro servo motor, which is a component conveniently included in Tinkercad's parts library, and a couple holes for cables to route to the inside. I modeled a simple lid which is designed to attach to the horn of the micro servo. You can grab my design directly from Tinkercad to make your own changes, or download my STLs at the link in the description. I printed the parts on my Creality CR-10S Pro printer with gold PLA filament. I used a small drill bit to increase the size of the holes on the servo horn, then used screws to attach the servo to the 3D printed lid. Then I installed the motor lid assembly into the motor shaped cutout on the bowl holder 3D printed part. The circuit is controlled by a Node MCU ESP8266 Wi Fi microcontroller. I used header pins on a Perma Proto board to make the micro servo motor easily detachable.
servo headers are connected to the Node MCU as follows. The yellow servo wire to Node MCU D1, red servo wire to power either 3 volts or VIN, and the black servo wire to ground. Plug the motor header into the microcontroller board's header pins and plug the circuit into the computer with a USB cable. The Arduino sketch joins your Wi-Fi network and uses network time protocol to fetch the current time, then opens or closes the lid according to a hard-coded schedule. Copy the code you can find at the link in the description, update your Wi-Fi credentials and UTC time offset, I'm in the Eastern time zone, and upload it to your Node MCU board using the Arduino IDE. To make this code, I basically did what I always do, which is mash up multiple sample codes to achieve the basic functions I'm looking for. I made a video about this technique that I'll link in a card and down below. Basically, I took the NTP example and mashed it up with the servo sweep example, in which I changed the range of motion of the servo to be smaller than the default. I still need to improve this code to remove servo jitter, and I'm wide open to your suggestions. I routed the wires to the inside of the bowl holder, plugged the cat feeder into an outlet using a USB AC adapter. The way this simple code is written, it is meant to be booted up in the open state and will only change its lid position at the time threshold specified in the Arduino sketch. Thanks for following along. I'm curious if you have any ideas to improve the design or modify it for a different purpose. Let me know what you're working on in the comments below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe with the bell to be notified of my future projects about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. See you next time.